announcement. There's a reception with wine and food, but no wine or food for students immediately after. Reception <laughs> with food and wine after the lecture. Please come make your lecture. Um, before I introduce the uh, lecture tonight, um, this idea of giving people that, inner, that are in or around architecture to come lecture to us, I'm still working on it. We have uh, we're lucky to get uh, Klaus Bollinger, who's maybe the preeminent engineer in the world for weirdo architects. He'll also be bringing an assistant who will run a workshop on a finite element analysis program um, with Justin and Christy. Uh, Christy and uh, that will be a three day workshop where you learn how to use this kind of structural analysis tool and then you'll meet the person who's presenting it. The one kind of lecture I really want and I'm really having a hard time finding, and I'm going to ask anybody here that knows anybody who would recommend it, who recommend it, is I'm looking for a client. Like, I want a client to come tell a story about what it's like to work with an architect. Pavel is pretty close, but. <laughs> And now I've only found two kinds of clients. The ones that have sued architects, and they really want to come tell their story. <laughs> it's pretty familiar. And then there's the other kind that became architects. They work with an architect, and they immediately became architects. So if you know any clients that have uh, funny stories about their relationship to architects, the one I'm trying to contact is the uh, judge that Tom worked with in Oregon. Uh, anyway, just, even if you don't know him, Heard something interesting, let me know. I'm gonna try. I just want to get a client to come in and talk about what a nightmare it was. <laughs> tonight, however, I think that tonight's lecture should be really fun and really interesting. And it should be fun and interesting for reasons that you, we can't figure out how to teach you. And that is that designing a building is fun, and even designing it all the way through uh, design development is fun. But the most fun thing in the world is building. Not because you're going to not make you out of hammer. It is because working out the problems of turning your designs into a physical structure at that scale and at, with that weight and at that cost, um, occupying so many different trades, so many different um, laws, it just dwarfs design. So even though the school is very interested in you understanding that there are ideas about design, that ideas that affect people's lives in obvious ways and obvious ideas that affect people's lives in less than obvious ways. The most fun part of the business, and the, the most fun part of the discipline, is actually building a building. And you should think of yourself that building the building is your building. I mean, even if you're not out there hammering it, uh, those are the problems that are, that are problem. those are the puzzles that you'll have to solve. It's like one gigantic Sudoku that you get sued if you get it wrong. <laughs> so, Pavel gets off as a very interesting man. I met him in New York, although we're now colleagues in Cyber. He's an architect in his own right and a member of a, a collective in Los Angeles called Studio Interiors, so that's right, a multidisciplinary, if I'm correct. Uh, and if you look on the website, it looks like it would be really an interesting thing if I could just figure out how to get into the website. I, don't, I sort of click buttons and stuff, so I didn't make it into the website. I'm very kind to have somebody write these biographies of these people who I invite. I just met him on the streets of New York. The really the truth is, I was talking with Tom about uh, building the Cooper Union building in New York City. And Tom kind of mumbled all the time. He was sort of mumbling about problems with the, the construction workers there versus what it was like in Los Angeles. So I said, well, good. You know, tell me about that. And he said, no, no, you need to go talk about Pablo. Pablo was his consultant both on, is this correct, on the Caltrans building in Los Angeles and in the Cooper Union building in New York, which means he dealt with many different kinds of trade unions, many different kinds of labor situations, many different kinds of laws, and he had to negotiate basically the same architectural ideas in two extremely different environments. So I thought it would really be fun to ask him. Actually, it, it's kind of, you know, usually you ask somebody to ask him to focus their own work. I'm actually focusing his consulting work for somebody else in the hopes that we'll also have him back to show us his work. He's a really neat guy. So He's also, he's also from Bulgaria, which I think is sort of interesting. Sofia, Bulgaria. 
Yeah, that is fine. <laughs> this is where all those singers that you hear on the, you know, um, James Bond movies, the, the Bulgarian women. Voices. Voices. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm extremely pleased. Uh, Actually, I met uh, Jeff uh, 20 years ago uh, in SIAC when he was teaching, but I was such a bad student that most probably don't remember me since then. Actually, uh, I do have uh, stories to tell about this time, but this is a whole other subject. So we can, uh, not for me, actually, it was a great experience, but this is exactly true, which um, how we met after that uh, uh, on the job site. He was touring with Tom and everything is correct. Uh, and uh, I'm just taking it from there, literally immediately after the, our conversation, I make this picture there, uh, which is from uh, Cooper Union, uh, sitting in a very specific space, looking down, taking this picture, send it via email uh, to Morphosis. And um, with all the smart uh, people who are there, they start immediately making comment. Uh, the first one was uh, ground control to major Tom, uh, spelled T-H-O-M. Uh, and uh, uh, the other one was, uh, um, uh, the, the ship is lost in space. And actually, uh, that is what uh, started me thinking uh, about uh, what we are doing at the time, because um, what is uh, happening and what was happening uh, in the last uh, 10 years uh, uh, in the profession was there was enormous amount of uh, building and construction. You can see it everywhere, internationally, in the United States. And uh, there were some uh, specific techniques, relationship, uh, contract, uh, contract uh, types uh, uh, which were established. And now with the so-called Great Recession, uh, I'm afraid that, uh, not that I'm afraid, but uh, there is a chance that m a lot of this, uh, this relationship, this way of practicing architecture uh, might be lost. So I never uh, refuse to uh, come and to uh, share my experience. And this is not a lecture. This is more like a, um, a, an, a, a, an experience which I would like to share with you and just to start with thinking uh, for a few things for those of you who haven't uh, done so uh, before. So um, uh, if you stretch even uh, back uh, um, for 20 years, I'm, uh, uh, yes, I'm from Bulgaria. Uh, and, um, uh, and I came about 20 something years ago and I get the chance uh, to always work uh, on a building which, get, uh, which got constructed. And um, uh, also a lot of things changed in these uh, 20 years. Uh, this, if you see this, all of the building which I have been involved, to, um, uh, there are uh, three buildings in Los Angeles which are relatively uh, the same uh, square, uh, the same uh, size, the same square footage, but they have been done for a different uh, time span and which is more interesting uh, for a different, with a different uh, uh, staff, uh, which are much, much uh, uh, less uh, architects. And um, that is a, a tendency which is just going into the profession and uh, right now it's even more streaming, uh, streamlining um, uh, and uh, it's something which you should be uh, concerned. Uh, I'm looking at one aspect of why this is happening uh, because uh, we are just uh, getting more lean and we are just, uh, there is um, uh, more technology in our work. Uh, um, there is uh, more interference with the trades directly. We start acting more and more like um, uh, master builders, what the architect was. And uh, uh, it, it should be interesting for you also that uh, last year about uh, in June in uh, New York Times, uh, there was uh, this article in which was saying that actually the output of production of, uh, in the United States was to the pre-recession level with 7 million jobs less. And I don't want to, well, this is not a political statement, this is a fact uh, which you should be aware of. Uh, I'm speaking for the, uh, for the uh, uh, students uh, who are here, that there will be less and less people uh, involved uh, in, the, in, in the design work. And you have to develop uh, other skills than just the traditional uh, skills um, that which you're having, um, uh, uh, just the traditional uh, design skills. Uh, uh, so, am I further or back? So basically, again, to, uh, to uh, summarize it, uh, we, in the last 20 years, most probably we have been uh, into the, um, in the new stage, uh, advanced architecture. Uh, there have been a lot of written to it. Uh, basically, uh, these are all quotes. Um, uh, it relates to the information age the same way the modern architecture was relating uh, to the industrial age. And uh, uh, some of the factors uh, which are uh, driving this architecture is uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, architectural action is the globalization, uh, how this reflects uh, you. I mean, you have a much a bigger choice of materials 
uh, from around the world. Uh, uh, more people are involved uh, into the uh, uh, design from different countries. They bring uh, their uh, culture. Uh, it's economical change. Um, we are living in the economy which is very much related to the stock market, how this affects you. Well, what uh, maybe the steel today is more expensive than the concrete, but tomorrow the concrete will be more exp uh, expensive uh, uh, than the steel. So you always work on a budget and you have to fit yourself uh, uh, into this. And this linear process, which uh, you have, let's say, in the project like Getty Center, in which you design the building, uh, make uh, uh, um, uh, the schematic design, design development after get for a bit, is irrelevant because you're not working in this stable uh, economy with a predictable inflation. You're working in a very flexible market when you constantly I have to uh, modify uh, your process in order to, uh, to meet uh, the goal. And the goal uh, 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 is uh, uh, for us is the design, but uh, if you look at the owner, and this is why it's interesting to bring um, an owner here to discuss with you, in many cases, uh, this is the cost of the building. It's most of the cases, and this indeed is one of the things which is very difficult uh, to be um, a study in a uh, school. Uh, and also there is um, the one more thing uh, uh, with all of this environment in which we're building, uh, that is uh, Cooper Union in uh, this hotel across uh, uh, the, the street. Uh, we, uh, the, uh, uh, the advanced architecture, this stage in which we are, uh, is having, uh, if I can generalize, like a two major three. One of them is a custom architecture and the other one is uh, a uh, the catalog architecture, you know, and uh, Jeff 20 years uh, ago was um, speaking in Sarah about this. It was a very uh, progressive uh, uh, thought for, for the school at the moment that the modern architecture have generated a huge catalog of, uh, um, uh, of spaces, elements, and there is one way to uh, use them. And still there will be a critical architecture which you have to uh, reinvent um, uh, many of the, the relationship into the space, the space itself, and so on. And this is a two a very a good example. On one hand, you have a hotel, which is a mainstream uh, building. Uh, there is a huge catalog of, uh, from how big the rooms are to where you put uh, the uh, elevators and uh, what kind of materials you use. There is a huge catalog of uh, curtain walls, and you pretty much can pick up from this catalog and generate this building. On the other hand, uh, you have this 150-year uh, old institution, uh, which is actually approaching morphosis and uh, before that uh, 127 architects to be reduced all the way to, uh, uh, to morphosis uh, to, uh, for the selection of morphosis, which actually have with the building to redesign the future of this institution for additional 50 or maybe uh, 100 uh, years uh, because uh, um, the, with the cost increase, uh, the education is getting more expensive. They have to, the endowment which the school has is the, one of the very few school in the state, in the country which uh, uh, every student go there for free. So they have to reinvent and to make uh, a, new, um, a new kind of a program and the building was a huge part uh, of this. Uh, how you re So uh, uh, you basically cannot pick up from a catalog of uh, uh, elements or spaces or a special relationship or even a construction relationship uh, to, um, uh, to do it. So that uh, method which I'm discussing uh, today uh, is mostly uh, applicable for a, uh, this kind of a critical architecture, uh, which is a custom-made uh, uh, architecture. And that is the one in which uh, you have to, uh, to be uh, more involved in the way which I'm describing. For me, this um, interest uh, started in a um, in a project which I was with another firm uh, then. Uh, this is the, um, uh, uh, the theater in San, uh, uh, in, um, uh, sorry, in Phoenix. It's just across the street of uh, Richard Meyer building. And um, the, for the first time then after we did uh, these traditional bids and they were uh, like different uh, uh, contractors and the difference of the bid was uh, um, not that much, but the project was uh, over budget when it was bidded. It was done in the traditional way. They, one of the uh, obscure contractors at the time stand up the owner and say, look, uh, if you talk to the owner, and the owner was very interesting uh, group of people. They uh, were from the uh, owners of the Diamondbacks uh, to Alice Cooper, for those of you who remember this uh, uh, singer, they were in the same business group, uh, actually. Uh, so the, the, the contractor stand up and say, look, I can deliver this building on the requested $30 million budget if you like me, uh, if you allow me uh, to break uh, the so well-established families of trades which are associated with this, with, 
with each contractor, which means to uh, liberalize uh, the market of the trade, so they're bidding against uh, uh, each other in a larger scale, not just in front of the uh, contractors. And there was one lesson, and the second was that uh, during this uh, um, process, uh, we uh, just, uh, again, it was a traditional process uh, project delivery, uh, design, bid, build, uh, but um, uh, we have to redesign and build it again. So we start involving uh, the trades very early, uh, even in this configuration. And for example, here is um, the, uh, the, what you see, the, ter the terrazzo. There is actually not a terrazzo. We have to save uh, some money. Uh, so we uh, start looking around and we find that in Phoenix, the aggregate of the concrete is very colorful. It's naturally colorful. They're just, uh, if for those of you who have been in the desert, you can see all of these different gravels. So uh, we just change uh, the cement uh, and the uh, uh, gravel inside. We make a few uh, tests on the job site uh, with a um, different uh, level of grinding, and we got uh, uh, this kind of a terrazzo looking a, um, uh, a, a floor, which was for the, for the uh, amount of the polished concrete, which also break the other point uh, which I'm, uh, um, uh, I'm discussing, is that uh, every uh, project uh, is um, uh, designed for a specific, uh, uh, with a specific team, with a specific task, uh, with a specific uh, time frame. So you cannot have these uh, pre-ready um, uh, solutions. And immediately after that, uh, uh, Tom asked me to uh, join uh, Morphosis uh, just for uh, this building. He promised me this will be the only one building. Again, you can do your things. And 10 years later, I'm still speaking about uh, uh, his work. But uh, if you look here carefully, uh, you'll see that this uh, uh, 1.2 million square foot of a building, which was done for two years and a half from the design uh, to construction, um, uh, was uh, done uh, uh, in, a, uh, as a, in a very, uh, in, in, in a time striking and like mind blowing uh, time and with a very high uh, quality. Uh, just to tell you, uh, when we, we started, as you can see here, in uh, 2001 was the competition. Immediately after that, uh, the design development, the construction documents, and the permit process was going forward. Actually, uh, we got, when we got our, pro, uh, our permit, we were somewhere around here, I believe. And uh, um, this uh, could be done only because the design, the, all the process was redesigned. The process, and that is uh, the essential thing. If you, I don't know uh, how long uh, you're going to survive for listening to this uh, quite a technical uh, discussion, uh, but if you have to take away something with you uh, tonight. Uh, this uh, is that uh, for if you want to make a custom architecture and if you want to design an advanced architecture, you have to design also the process or the critical framework in which this building is delivered. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, it was a state building. So many rules on the process were, were broken. Uh, they were asking for a uh, assist. Uh, uh, the typical uh, diagram is you're having a, um, a design architect who work uh, for in the uh, schematic uh, phase, and after that, a design build a structure which consists of executive architect and um, uh, a contractor is uh, delivering uh, the building. The first thing which Morphos is set is uh, no, well, we will be the so called architect one, we also will be the executive architects. There is no way uh, to, cha to make this building in a, such a short distance if you don't uh, make this uh, uh, thing. So um, the, uh, Morphosis became the executive architect, which uh, marginalized the architect who was supposed to be an executive architect. Uh, also, the contract on the other hand said it's a state building. Uh, we have to, um, uh, we have to uh, beat everything which is out there. But the only way we can do it, if you get these six major trades and to take them out of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the context and we, to hire them before we start bidding the rest of the, um, of the building. That is the only way we actually uh, can deliver this project, which means basically what uh, later generated, uh, what later, later became the so-called integrated project delivery process. Uh, that was one of the first steps in which this was, uh, this was made. A lot of uh, contractors and subcontractors were put together very early into the project to make this decision instead of waiting for them after the schematic design, design de development, and uh, construction documents. And this unleashed um, an enormous uh, um, creativity in both contractors and uh, uh, architects. Uh, each one of these 
innovation which we made on the building uh, can be tracked as a separate talk, but I'm just selecting a few of them. This is the, so the short grid which was done into the foundation. Uh, it's a nice picture, this is why I'm including it. And that one also was uh, what, uh, after that, we say, well, if you're doing this thing for the foundation, why we don't extend it and make all of this um, decorative concrete, which you see here, this concrete here, why we just don't make it as a, this short grid, which is a very cheap material, we just have to put the boards outside and to start shooting uh, um, against it. So uh, many other elements like the, all of the photovoltaic system, uh, which you see uh, there, here, uh, was not on the budget. Basically, uh, if you, um, um, uh, every state project comes with a very specific spec of what you can do. Uh, the spec which Morphos is received for the building, which have to be actually requested to building like that, literally like that. I'm serious. It was like a stucco building with a strip windows. Uh, if this was done in a traditional way of a project delivery, yes, this is most probably uh, what would have end up for the money which we have, and you cannot deviate from the budget um, uh, uh, of this. But uh, this is, was not the, uh, uh, the case. As I said, uh, it was uh, a very inventive process in which everybody was involved from the very early, and we were able to make uh, all these decisions. And uh, to put this one in a, in a context also, because we are speaking about uh, the trades on a different uh, level. And I also want to mention that when I'm saying trades, the lecture is called trades, I'm speaking like a noun and as a verb. Uh, because what I'm discussing here is also the, uh, the designing a project as a negotiation uh, between all the parties and with yourself uh, into, uh, into, one, uh, 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 into, uh, into the same uh, process. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that um, uh, each, each of the uh, areas in which uh, in each particular context, uh, you're dealing uh, with a very particular uh, a tradition, uh, 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 building traditions and climatic conditions. And uh, um, uh, uh, for example, I mean, you can just see the, what are the differences. They look like a two a very, uh, um, like a two similar building, but actually they are quite different. Uh, uh, I'm just speaking about the skin as a case study uh, for, the, uh, for the building. And uh, uh, to the last detail, to the actuator which are opening it, and you always can say, well, in the Caltrans, in the opening that way because it's uh, California, you want the sun to get away. In uh, uh, New York, you want them to open that way because uh, you want the sun to get on the, uh, to get on the, um, on the inner skin during uh, uh, the winter. Uh, and also in Caltrans, you can do pneumatic actuators. In uh, uh, New York, uh, you have to do electrical uh, actuators. Um, uh, and. Um, uh, uh, to go back to the, uh, to the implying the traits in an inventive way, uh, if you start looking at the facade of, a, uh, of a, uh, Caltrans, which was supposed to be a stucco facade, um, and uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with how the stucco is made, like you have the studs, uh, you have uh, uh, the, the insulation between the studs, you have the dense glass, which is the sheeting, after that you have the waterproofing, after that you have the stucco, uh, which is like a brown coat, scratch coat, finish coat, the painting, everything, which doesn't do anything, the stucco itself, but protecting uh, the, the waterproofing. Uh, if you start inventively reassemble and to relook at this, you're saying, yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is what, we, what we have is, uh, we have the dense glass, which is the sheeting, but after that, what is going to happen uh, if uh, we, instead of putting this paper, which is the waterproofing, what if we put a roofing membrane on this? So after that, uh, we're putting the roofing membrane. What is going to happen uh, if uh, this roofing membrane is not, uh, it should not be UV exposed, so it can be something like Sagnafil, a wonderful material, which actually allows you to overlap it's like a heat welding. It's, the sheets can go in, in, either, in either direction. You're just welding it. It's very, uh, the, re, the, the result is that uh, um, instead of uh, 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 you know, having all this scaffolding and having all of these uh, traits running with the buckets up and down to make the scratch coat, there were two people who rubbed the entire building with the membrane. And uh, also, uh, we introduce a very early trade, which actually is done, is, um, is usually hired when the building is finished. This is the window washing 
uh, 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 contracted. So we actually with the window washing um, uh, equipment, the panels were uh, installed. This could not have been done in a traditional way of project delivery where the contractors, the architect and the subcontractors are disconnected uh, from uh, each other. Uh, the method which I'm, uh, uh, pro, uh, which I'm discussing here is actually the one which is of collaboration and which have uh, also a contractual um, uh, backup uh, on this because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, AI have recognized about six different um, uh, multi-party contractors, so it's, uh, it's a very valuable method. So, and immediately after that uh, we were, uh, um, Morphosis was uh, hired uh, for uh, the next job, which was Cooper Union. And uh, the, uh, again, uh, they started the selection process with about 127 uh, architects. After that, reduced them to 27. Um, after that, uh, it went to six. And the way the office was selected was bef before even we draw a single line, uh, was actually they went and started discussing our buildings with the owner, with the contractor, with the subcontractor. And I remember when they came to Caltrans, we gave them a, um, uh, a tour and they wanted to be alone with the one room in which were the contractors and, uh, uh, and the owners. And after this discussion, pretty much was clear that, uh, um, that um, the project gonna go uh, for, uh, for Morphosis because uh, the clients out there are, uh, in a way, uh, I mean, if I have to step out, the traditional process of like a competition in which you submit your great design ideas uh, because of the informational age in which we live is almost obsolete. Uh, because before, when I was uh, in school and after school, you apply to international competition, 200, 300 people appear. Today, uh, if you put an international competition like this, what is it going to be like? Uh, 50,000 people going to show up like easy. How are you going to judge those people? Indeed, how are you going to judge for, uh, for how many days you're going to need just to judge a dispute? So, for, uh, um, in a lot of cases, the competitions actually uh, don't go to the, to the boards. They're actually selecting uh, people or architectural offices who have a proven record. And, and I know that it's not a very um, a kind of a, uh, something what you want to hear as young architects, but uh, this is a part of the, uh, part of the reality. So, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, for that project, they wanted a traditional uh, uh, way of uh, delivering the curtain wall. I'm speaking again for the I'm just using the curtain wall as the exterior wall as a, as a, um, a case study. Uh, we went to two few uh, different uh, um, manufacturers. They came out and, uh, and installers, and they came with a number which was about uh, two times more than what we want here. Uh, they were not flexible. And uh, then again, uh, we, uh, of course, we send the uh, tradition. We redesigned the process again. We said, this ain't gonna be that way. We're just gonna uh, merge together subcontractors who most probably never have worked together, but are willing to work, and um, we're gonna uh, go further. So if you look at this, uh, that is the um, uh, uh, Cooper Union, the exterior wall uh, on the skeleton. You have a first skin, which is the waterproofing, which in uh, a, um, uh, compared to Caltrans, we swear the uh, waterproofing uh, roofing membrane was. Again, comparing the trades uh, between California and, Los, uh, uh, and uh, New York was uh, in New York, there was no way uh, you can just put studs and uh, you put um, after that uh, the uh, roofing membrane on the top of it. Because the strong labor unions, which are there, uh, don't allow you to do this. There is no way you can put the roofer on the facade of the building. That is, just the, that is just the law, and they're protecting it. The other thing is the actuators, which we installed afterwards, uh, they say, well, if this actuator just come here that way uh, to the job site, our uh, local electrical, they're just gonna snap the cord out of it before they install it, because this is what they, uh, they have to do. So we have to work around those things and to make them, well, if this is not possible, what we can do? Uh, we can, instead of putting a thermoplastic membrane, actually we can put all around the building, um, here as a first layer is a double skin system. We can put like a unitized system, which can be like the cheapest which is available around because it's not visible. Actually, if I step again, 
of the subject, or maybe I'm still on the subject, is the, the double skin walls are one of the, can be, they could be uh, one of the less expensive uh, walls out there. And those two buildings are uh, uh, real proof for that. Because on the inside, uh, you have to find uh, the enclosure which is uh, most appropriate and which is uh, for the local conditions. Uh, in this case, that was the unitized system. Uh, and uh, in Caltrans, that was the stick wall which was there. Uh, the thermoplastic membrane would work there. It will not work uh, here because of the, again, of the temperature differentiation. So on the inside, you can do something which work. On the outside, you can put some uh, layer which doesn't have uh, to, um, doesn't have to, to work functionally. It doesn't have to, uh, to protect the building from the elements. So it can have purely a cultural uh, or aesthetical or uh, any other impact. And also can have a, uh, um, a sustainable effect because uh, with the double skin, you know that we are uh, getting this um, uh, uh, layer of air inside which actually stratifies through the, uh, through the cavity and keeps the building always cool or uh, hot, uh, respectively, in the summer and in the winter. So my point is that uh, both systems, if you look at this, uh, they are uh, pretty much the uh, same. But if you look like a detail by detail, uh, they're different, not only because of the climatic conditions, but also because of the specific, uh, uh, struct, uh, um, uh, specific uh, um, construction traditions which were, uh, which were um, uh, typical for the local um, environment. Again, it's, uh, uh, in, um, uh, a stick, uh, you cannot put the stick wall for the, because of the unions here in uh, Los Angeles, a unitized interior wall would have been a very, uh, a very expensive. That is in a, a larger detail. So, again, comparison with the two walls. I mean, in one hand, you have the, and, uh, everything what is behind. This is off the shelf. And here again, this wall here is also off the shelf. This is the custom made wall on the set. The assembly is also custom uh, made. Um, one important thing which you uh, have speaking of trades, uh, we uh, have to, uh, uh, to keep in mind that you're working through a transitional period. Every generation is working to some kind of a transitional period. In your generation is the fact that uh, the different trades, uh, clients, architects, uh, will be with a different level of, techno of technological knowledge. In one side, you're gonna have a, um, uh, a trait like this is Zainer, uh, one of the best, uh, uh, and I am really saying it, I don't have stuck in there, uh, I mean, I don't have interest in their stock. Uh, that is one of the, mo of the most advanced uh, metal fabricator. They're from Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, you just have to give them the model and some idea, and from that on, they can fully develop the wall, uh, um, the elements, the units, of course, uh, you'll see going uh, um, back and forth. Uh, they, they can work with the local installers to make the, pro and even, uh, uh, that is a good example, you can modify the process of installation. If you look carefully here, actually the exterior wall, the perforated wall, is installed before the waterproofing, and the building still doesn't leak. It's like, just because you can go that deep with this process of installation. So in one hand, hand you have these manufacturers, trades, uh, installers who are really advanced in technologically, in as uh, um, uh, computer-wise. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, you see this, this continue all the way. This is, uh, these are sketches actually from construction administration where we're exchanging models, 3D models, and we are looking for identifying problems or issues on the facade to the last detail because in this corner, which you see here, there are like seven different manufacturers and installers which are coming uh, to the building. Yeah, so uh, that is one side, the, the very advanced uh, 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 builders. Uh, this is just an eye candy, just to keep you on tension. I can discuss more about this, but yeah. Uh, the other th the, on the other side, you have a trades which are really good at what they do, but they're not that technologically advanced. and um, uh, this is uh, the case uh, with, um, with, the, uh, with the concrete. Actually, very good guys. Um, a, uh, 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 Century Max, uh, totally, totally computer 
not literate. Actually, the details are drawn by uh, uh, the also very good detailer from Phoenix, from all the places with pencil. Who, um, uh, for when we, we are going to discuss these elements here, these columns, uh, which uh, uh, he couldn't get uh, um, uh, the idea how to make because they only look, look that simple, but when you start twisting uh, columns in space, uh, you'll see that there's some, uh, they're not just kind of lines. They have volumes and they have to make, uh, uh, so they couldn't, uh, we, we just sent uh, the, the drawings in a traditional way. We just make every single possible drawing they couldn't get. So what we started doing, we actually start printing elements of the building and sending it with the drawings. So the process became uh, really fast. So, uh, uh, and in the other hand, you don't uh, want uh, somebody else who actually can read computer drawings but doesn't know what to do on the field. I mean, look at this, I mean, pouring a column like that with all the vibrations, with all the uh, shoring, with all, it's, it's a very difficult thing. So, my point is that you as an architect, you have also modi to modify your process. Uh, if you just say, uh, no, I will not uh, 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 do this, you should make, you're either gonna lose the contract and then come with somebody uh, who doesn't know what he's doing, or they maybe uh, change your design. And uh, all of this is done uh, here uh, with a purpose. Uh, uh, actually, uh, to, uh, uh, there is a, a stronger requirement for transparency in the first floor. Uh, there, is, uh, there wasn't a requirement, but what are you going to do? It's a part of the city, so it's, uh, um, no, we have to, to do something which is addressing uh, the public. There is also a desire from uh, uh, the office, from Tom, uh, the, uh, to break this typical, opa, this, uh, typical frontage which is uh, so sacred in New York. We definitely wanted to make something which is more transparent uh, and uh, actually which engages even the uh, people who are walking on the street. You're actually in this zone uh, in which uh, you're in between uh, inside or outside of the building. So again, the point is that uh, we are uh, uh, to maintain or to protect your design effort those days. The further you go with the design, with the idea, the further you have to, do, to go with understanding how the building is built and how many interests are in this building and to help uh, with your skills, with your know-how uh, to move uh, the project ahead if you want, as I said, to protect um, the design. Uh, that one is um, uh, and it's an example which um, actually we were discussing. This is this is the element which started the discussion with Jeff when they were visiting uh, uh, with Tom. Uh, is uh, uh, another important element uh, of the building was the ceilings, the radiant ceilings. This is the largest uh, radiant cooling and heating in New York City, uh, maybe in, in the country. Uh, is uh, very advanced uh, uh, on, on many levels, not only as a mechanical uh, system, uh, but also as a saving space, and so on and so on. So there was this idea to have these ceilings going throughout the building. So, proposing a um, uh, radiant uh, cooling and heating immediately triggered the question between the trades. What is this? Is it a ceiling tile or it's a mechanical unit? Right away. And each one of them with the labor protection law, they, they, each one of them was supposed to start claiming it and you cannot just, uh, uh, you cannot just jump on from one trade to another, that is a very local. In, in uh, some other place, maybe Los Angeles, this wouldn't been that much of a problem. As I told, like the people who are supposed to do the stucco, actually the same organization did the, um, uh, uh, did the thermoplastic plastic roofing membrane. In New York, this couldn't happen. So what uh, this ended up, which have to modify the process, we actually brought uh, the, maybe until the end of the, I will learn which one is forward, which one is back. Um, uh, by, um, so we, we involved uh, all, of the, all of the trades, both as a contractor, subcontractors, uh, uh, designers. I mean, you see how much of a mechanical there is there. Uh, you know, two, and we start, these are some mock-ups, which we start um, doing uh, right away. And we literally uh, designed the system with all of these representatives, uh, including people from the unions, just to design how, they, and in the end what it happened, uh, it was actually, uh, you can, See it uh, here is the building, the system was broke to uh, several distinct elements. And um, uh, if you look at this, there was a super grid and some of the panels which you see uh, inside here, actually, uh, no matter they look exactly the same, some of these panels 
here I installed and manufactured by the ceiling contractor I mean, uh, and these are done actually by the mechanical contractor. Not to mention uh, the, uh, the lights are coming in being installed by a completely different guy. This is why we have these openings there for the lights and so on and so on. So again, that is the extra step uh, which is, and this one is getting even more complicated when it comes to the laps because you have like uh, one more element here uh, which is the uh, Unistrad which is carry all of the uh, information so you can make it flexible to drop uh, informational or uh, electrical uh, relays uh, from there. Uh, and um, uh, I can go on and on. We don't have enough time to discuss and I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, my point is that uh, uh, one, the next point is that one big project is not one big project. One big project is a million small projects. And there is no a point, there is a point from which a project cannot get any better. I believe in this. Uh, you can see this in school also. But there is no point from which the project cannot go down to the drain. You know, it's, and this also <laughs> is, is, uh, goes for the studio projects. I mean, you have to know this, but it's all our subject. So here, in, in, in really to maintain this integrity of the design, and this is an important world, the integrity of design, and this is one of your responsibilities as an architect to maintain this integrity, you have to understand that this project consists of a million smaller projects, and you have to address them uh, with an equal um, uh, amount of uh, attention and um, uh, care. Uh, and uh, um, in the context of which, uh, that is the atrium, uh, which like uh, many uh, think uh, coming out of from, a, uh, from a very artistic uh, mind. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, discussing the design of Tom Main and Mor Morphosis. I'm sure Jeff can do this. He has been following him for a, for a long time and this is not the subject of the lecture. But uh, um, uh, uh, Tom is a very artistic design. He has a strong intuition and a lot of the uh, elements uh, uh, which have a pragmatical, uh, uh, which have a pragmatical function, like uh, uh, like this atrium, which is going out, uh, going through the building, and which is unifying these different schools into the uh, university, the architectural, uh, this make this a kind of a vertical campus there. Uh, the form, the shape of this is coming from a very strong artistic uh, perspective, uh, which was expressed by this diagram. And uh, from that point, in order to make it work that way, we have to make a very strong effort uh, to be done. And uh, that is certainly one way uh, to do uh, hundreds of those models with a different shape. This is still the, the, uh, the atrium. Uh, but uh, in the end of the day, none of them is resolving uh, how to be, uh, how this to be uh, actually uh, built. Um, uh, it's a, because it's this kind of a entity which just go into the uh, into the building uh, uh, element, and uh, no matter how uh, uh, elaborate we are doing it, uh, you still come to a point in which you have uh, uh, to build it. And we went through a, several experiments again involving the particular trades uh, very early, and that was when we involved one trade which is doing all of these finishes. And it, uh, if you look at them, I mean. Look at this, I mean, every one of you, and I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the complex geometries. In order to make this complex form, uh, imagine all of these connections, how different they have to be. And what if the level, which means how more expensive they're going to be, which means that most probably they're going to scratch this shape, uh, which is in a very particular uh, budget. Uh, so um, the solution uh, for this was uh, for Morphosis to develop a digital model of uh, every uh, single uh, element. And what it was done, it was again, two traits which never, ever, ever meet on the building were married together to do this thing. And I'm speaking for the scaffolding contractor and from the, for the, um, the molding contractor, right? These uh, Corinthian moldings, which you have seen, or whatever is the name. So these are the two people. So you're breaking the tasks to different things, and you say, well, uh, the people who are, uh, who are doing the scaffolding, can you do this uh, lattice out of the scaffolding pipes? Dirt cheap, dirt cheap. Just hang it as a, uh, uh, as a curtain wall from inside, but there is no uh, load, like a wind load, and so on and so on. And we're going to give you every one of these notes. And they found this um, uh, steel ball from the shelf, which they just move around as uh, these balls on the abacus. Yeah? 
So whenever they reach a particular place from our drawings, actually from our computer models, they say, top, spot welded here. And after that, you're spot welding the vertical element, which gives you the opportunity compared to, to this thing. Look at this. In this case, you have all of these angles, which you have to, to weld and to, to protect. And in the other case, you just have one ball, which is just moving. And when the other pipe comes to weld with it, it's always on a surface, which is equal for every single point. Just back on the budget. Yeah? And the next step is the same guys who are putting the Corinthian molding, they don't care. I mean, it's just what is the element. So uh, if the element is this blade, which we took us some time to define exactly what we want to see, because also, as I said, there is no, if you look on Morphosis buildings, there is very few things which don't have any uh, pragmatical function behind this. This is also why the buildings are non-expensive. Uh, all of this is a light well, which bounces and reflects the light all the way down to the to this uh, uh, vertical campus, to this uh, major uh, public uh, uh, space. Uh, so they're just taking this, uh, uh, and also because of our computer drawings, to go back to the uh, uh, technological advancement, we uh, were able to reduce the entire mesh to only two uh, uh, elements, a straight element and a radius element, element with a constant radius five feet. So with those two elements, uh, the entire atrium was up. And this one is also to go, I mean, that is just the lattice is this. That is another uh, glass fiber for gypsum. We went through the same effort there. Also, there is uh, only uh, s uh, four, uh, only six shapes, and there are only three patterns which are rotating around, just to reduce it. Uh, not to mention the stair, the big lighting, uh, 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 And again, it's a public gathering space. That is what we, we have been addressing. This is what the idea was uh, about. And this is what all, the entire effort um, is uh, done. Uh, speaking of trades, I just want to mention, because um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, you will be going to offices which will be working uh, abroad, uh, there is a completely uh, different configuration and environment there. You have to learn it. Uh, for example, on this project, which is in Madrid, Spain, which is a social housing, uh, from uh, all the things. Uh, the local tradition uh, was, uh, as you know, it's, I mean, most of you know, it's, everything is done by, by brick, everything. And we wanted to, uh, to do these elements, which also have some environmental uh, meaning. They're shading the spaces below, you'll see it in the moment. And if this should have been done from brick, which they're doing, I mean, imagine, I mean, all of this uh, have to be supported by very massive uh, beam, and um, uh, uh, after that, to build a brick, and they will be much thicker than what we anticipated. So uh, we work with the trades there, and uh, we say, well, let's bring something of uh, Hollywood uh, here. Uh, so <laughs> what is, uh, this ended up being is actually inside uh, these uh, elements is a pure styrofoam, in which is wrapped with a mesh, and it's done like a stucco, which they can do perfectly. And after that finished, so they became this big, uh, cavity virandel beams, which are uh, which are uh, stretching uh, across to uh, to uh, uh, throughout the um, the building. So we just kind of a, this combination. Uh, go back to the, what I was discussing. This kind of a globalization in which uh, do um, and I want to uh, gonna go back. I mean, if you look at this, everything here is brick, right, all the way, even inside. So in this building, just stay out there with uh, all of them. It's actually it's very interesting uh, building. Is, um, I should discuss it somewhere. The other thing is that, for example, all of these infills are um, corrugated profile metal. And there is another specific about the trades. Let's say in Europe, a good material, a good space is done with a, and, and I'm just generalizing just to make the point. Uh, uh, no, there is exception for uh, always. But the good space is done with the good materials. Travertine is a good uh, thing. Uh, Marble is a good thing. The good installers go with the good trades. Some uh, not so prominent materials is the corrugated metal panel.
panel, which respectively this kind of a traits and skills are go within. So you have to spend uh, some uh, extra time in detailing just to say, no, no, this is exactly what we want. I mean, we want to make this thing non-expensive, but if you explain very carefully to the trades how exactly we want it, those unskilled workers actually can achieve uh, what is the design intent, again, for the same uh, amount of uh, money what was uh, before. And uh, uh, that one is um, one of the last points which I'm making. Uh, this kind of uh, um, the mold of uh, how you're delivering the project uh, uh, put you in a driving position as a designer because uh, uh, presents to you the opportunity uh, to work uh, directly in a large, with a large scale mockups and you can really use them as a design tool. So um, let's look at this. Uh, there are two, uh, two ways, like let's say in the traditional, you have the pre-schematic schematic design uh, series after the construction documents, you send your building for the bid and then you can start doing the mockup which there is a percentage of every, when you're making the specifications, uh, there is a percentage of every building or every big element of the building have to be done as a mock-up. So you have, let's say, let's say, speak, you have $10 million for uh, exterior enclosure, you have $500,000 for, uh, for mock-up. So what you can do in this process, if this come here, you, they're making the mock-up, you're building, your system leaks. What is it? It's being scratched out, and you either have to redesign it again, or they have to use something off the shelf, which triggers backwards uh, your, uh, it tempers down your, your creativity. Now, because you know that if your mock-up of your system is being checked and it starts leaking, uh, you are forcing yourself to do something which is have been proven. So hence, you go immediately to the pattern of uh, catalog architecture. You say, well, I'll just pick up something which, is, which already have been done. I'll change the color, I change the mullion, uh, I'll change the tilt a little bit, but it was the same shitty curtain wall which I have been looking all around and uh, just because I'm making this specific pattern there uh, and this photographs very well going to put me on the front of whatever magazine I'm looking at the moment and uh, you go with this thing. Right? And uh, if you want to do a critical architecture, uh, you is a kind of unlikely to take this part. You like to do something like that, which is the integrated project delivery pattern. You can find it. I highly stimulate everybody, teachers, uh, students, just to look at this method of project delivery. As I said, it's approved by, uh, by I mean, it's endorsed by AIA, and it can be used in many uh, projects in which we involve all of the contracts contractors and subcontractors for this particular system, very easy, and this, the respective phases are concept, criteria. What allows you to do is actually now, because it's a multi-party agreement, you have the budget, you involve with the contracts, you can take this mock-up and to bring it somewhere there. You can start doing the mock-up right away when you're designing. So then you can, all of this trial and error can be done right here. This $500,000 to 10 million, I'm just, as I said, this is like a theoretical number, instead of being done here, you can use them as a design tool. So you can do stuff. So, for example, uh, uh, that is like uh, from Caltrans, it's like actually there is a one thin wall between those two rooms. We are discussing that is the mock up of the building. And if you see, like, actually the final building doesn't have this thing, it's a completely different element there. It's one of the aesthetical visions. Here we are discussing this element right there, this out trigger, and the sequence of installation, how exactly going to be installed. And this, these are only two people you see, but actually the room is full. There are most probably about 30 people uh, uh, discussing it. And, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, if you go to Cooper Union, for example, if you see here, I mean, the it's a kind of a complex geometry when you're just going with this curve to a straight line, is this torus which actually touches the building, engages it with the park and the street around it, one of the very few freestanding buildings in New York. It's all surrounded by uh, streets, very unusual. The entire block can also have a park and uh, a plaza in front of it. So this uh, aggressive gesture is done to address this condition, uh, not unless the condition that there is the foundation building there and you really have to make this building communicated. But as I said, I will not talk about design. But here you're, you're dealing with this curve. Again, uh, you may just start pretending that you know 
what you're designing, and trust me, you don't, because some of those uh, firms have been in this business, I mean the trades for 100 years, and they know if they look a piece of metal, they can tell you which direction uh, is uh, the molecule of this metal is running. You may not even know that some of the, uh, of the metals are directional. I'm, I'm, I'm not sorry to diminish your knowledge. I'm just giving an example here. So the best thing what you're gonna, gonna, uh, can do if you have this integrated project delivery one, you're including it. This is a mock-up. That is a particular subcontractor. We, we ask them, what is the biggest panel which you can do with the biggest curve which you can do, like the, the, the I mean, the, the, the help set with the, actually the smallest radius, which you can, you can do without putting any frame on the back of the panel, which is going like, to, so you're getting the piece of metal, you're making uh, the panel, and you start bending it. So they're coming with this thing, you know, with this. Uh, so now we're going back to the drafting board or to the drafting monitor, whatever is the term today, and uh, then we're defining pretty much what is the corresponding shape uh, to, uh, uh, to the curve which we are trying to achieve without going over. That is another, uh, I mean, this is, this are numer the, the next uh, few slides are just uh, um, mock-ups of uh, mini mock-ups of the same panel this, until we come here. The, other, the way you go is, besides this big scale mock-up, you start mocking up the building in this virtual and physical space in which you're just going uh, to all of these elements in your making mock-up. So what you see here, that is the mock-up for the wind. In this particular element, actually with all of the data here, is um, to see is there the perforation going to give some noise from the wind. Uh, that is how much of a snow going to gather on the panel. Uh, immediately with that, just an, yet another mock-up. Uh, there was a huge resistance in the beginning about the perforation for the Cooper Union, just because it hadn't been done in New York before. Uh, and uh, we'll say, okay, what is the concern? There will be a lot of snow, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's valid concern after all. So we immediately we put these uh, panels, and when I say we, the contractor which wanted to get the job, the subcontractor, on the top of the existing building. So the president can look it for a two seasons, two winters, while he's going to see there is nothing dangerous, actually. Actually, it's going to work. There is uh, uh, nothing. Uh, 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 and uh, that is another test for, again, because it's a huge concern. This, this, curtain, this perforated uh, metal panel could have gone like that, that easy. Or I was just discussing with Jeff uh, uh, before that, that initially they wanted uh, a brick building. Surprise, and this one commencing. Uh, com I mean, I'm hugely appreciative what your school have done to make this wonderful building with all of the uh, brick which is going on, on around it is this tendency of uh, the school to like this uh, Harvard look or whatever. So this building was also, there was a proposal to be done, the Cooper Union to be done out of the uh, of brick and uh, one of the things which helped us when we started the process, they have to repoint the, their, um, uh, their um, uh, housing building which they have just done across the street, the tall building there and it cost them about the half of what they spent for the exterior roller for, for this one. So that was a, uh, one thing which helped. The other one was all of these tests which we make. And in one of the tests, uh, we, uh, uh, we find out that actually there is a substantial amount of snow which is going to gather there. So we are flying there. I see this one. It's like, well, this is impossible. So, and, the, and this is the machine in which it was done. This was in Dartmouth. Uh, um, the, and uh, they reluctantly recognized that actually the machine which is simulating the snow uh, will uh, we, is actually blowing uh, a uh, uh, ice balls. Not exactly. No machine can actually simulate the crystal fractal structure of uh, the real snowflake. So in the same moment, we saw that actually we we uh, we uh, towards us is heading a big snow storm, and uh, uh, we actually drag immediately the mock-up outside, uh, put a couple of cameras there and get on the plane and get out as fast as we could from there. And for the rest of the, of the winter, we were actually observing what is going on uh, on these uh, things. And uh, this I'm kind of going here because it's, we, uh, uh, I, I made a bet that actually there will not be continuous snow on the, uh, on the wall, which they were saying that it's going to be just like a car. So the moment I was able to take this picture, I sent it to everybody just because there is a stratified air which goes there. And I'm just, just not saying 
to say how smart we are as an architect is opposite. We know about this because all of this simulation which we make uh, and we rely on our experience and we have also our engineers and our engineers uh, they know some things which the contractor let's say doesn't know and we know that actually there is the, the air always going to stratify, go through the holes and never allow the, uh, the snow to, to go there. But again I'm just uh, uh, throwing this as uh, the, the environment through which we're going to mock up for the perforation, uh, the final mock up here in which you can see we're even changing colors um, and so on and so on. And uh, the, the last thing which is it's all about the collaboration. Uh, Jeff was asking uh, uh, how you teach this thing. Uh, I have like a couple of years ago uh, I was uh, holding this uh, position of uh, visiting professor of critical practice, whatever this means, uh, in the uh, University of uh, Arizona. Uh, but um, uh, they, uh, we did a studio in class. So we did this integrated project delivery class in which actually we took the students and gave them a real project. We dragged them with a real client. They have to present. We went to, uh, to the factories uh, and they will just went through the entire process in the same way. They were, well, close. You never can get uh, to, the, to, to exactly this. But there is a way, and I agree that it's still not perfect, but we, we, there is a way and these things start, have to start um, uh, uh, educate, uh, s uh, bringing uh, being, bring, uh, uh, to school. In the end, as I said, uh, it's all about uh, the trades, uh, it's uh, how you organize your process, traditional, very, very inventive, when you have a multi-party contract, the, your uh, um, uh, information modeling is this bonding uh, source uh, and uh, you're working uh, in the context of, uh, of this uh, collaboration. And as I said, it's, um, it's also about trades, like a, uh, uh, like a verb. Uh, the, I read this, this is this wonderful book, most probably you have it on your desktop, it's the Metapolis Dictionary of Advanced Architecture. I highly recommend it. Uh, uh, and uh, the, one of the quotes there was the contemporary architectural project is not just designed, it's also negotiated. And I cannot more agree with uh, that. Uh, 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 and in the end, this actually is uh, uh, making us nomads again. Uh, uh, we just have to uh, open uh, our mind and just uh, go around and uh, not only expect everything to come to us and to subordinate to our process, but we have to get uh, ourselves out there and to, and to, to work uh, aggressively. I, I, I will stop here. Yeah, if this is. Uh, okay. Thank you. So let me answer this one. First, uh, there is a question right on the money. You have to be aware that every trade work with a different tolerance. Uh, the, the concrete guys, they work with tolerance of one inch. So it's completely legal and acceptable if the slab edge to which we are putting your curtain wall to go up and down by one inch. And trust me, they do. Yeah? Uh, this is the, the nature of the, of the concrete. Uh, on the other hand, the tolerance of the curtain wall guy is somewhere between 116 and less. That is the industry standard. So you have to go there. Uh, it's not your job to be, to be the engineer, but you have to surrender this uh, difference between one or two inches and to make a gap of two inches and say, well, I have accommodated it and your building going to look in, a, in this particular way. or you have to go the other way and to say, well, I'm the architect of the building um, and you uh, will, uh, and will, uh, I will make a detail which is taking account of this tolerance and in the end, you're going to have uh, this uh, 3 16th of the inch which Richard Meyer provided on his building on the Getty Center. It's an opal joint for this uh, 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 1,000, uh, actually it's uh, 107 acre of gardens, buildings, I mean, everything is like the tolerance is less than a car, right? What you have on the car. So you, you work as an architect and say, well, it's important. 
In his case, and I'm making interpretation, I'm doing grids. Actually, this is a wonderful opportunity to describe, to make my architecture with a void. Actually, what describe architecture is, is non-existent, right? And I'm just gonna make it as minimal as possible. And he works, the entire 100 and whatever people we are working on the project is working towards that. So he's consulting with this engineer. The other way will be, if you look at many buildings which were done at that time in Los Angeles, they are saying, oh, I cannot tolerate, I cannot, I don't know how to make this tolerance. So I will just use different system, which the shingles are overlapping, or I'll just make a big joint and I'll just goop it with uh, silicone and uh, whatever happens. So it's not your job, but it's your decision in the end to decide how many engineer gonna involve and how much of your knowledge you're gonna apply to provide this thing, if it's important for you. Any other questions? <laughs> I have one more. How did you learn all this stuff? Uh, just by, or just by. How did they learn all this stuff? Oh, it just worked. I mean, if you have the, if you have the affinity to building, I mean, as Jeff said, I'm from Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, by the, the age of 15, you have to build one house. Otherwise, they, you know, they don't consider you, take you seriously. No matter in which profession you're gonna go, you work with, or they're like with your father, and you're just like me. This part of the, 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 the tradition, but that is a joke in, in a way. Uh, it's, uh, I learned a lot of the stuff in Meyer's office because it was during a recession then. It was worse than this recession, trust me, for architects in California. It kicked out effectively uh, the data which I know from AIA is somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of the profession of LA. They were kicked out of the profession because for a long time there was no work in California. So the only place was, let's say, uh, Getty and a few other uh, places. So Richard was able to collect uh, really good architects in one place. I was very young then and uh, get uh, the chance to work with them, so I learned a lot of them. But the basic, and there are other people who are learning it differently. The, the, Simple answer is that if you have affinity and you like to do this, uh, you go on the, in the offices which are building and also you stay through the project uh, from the beginning till the end. This is like what Tom was coming to me and said, oh, what are you doing? I have hired him or her for a designer and she wants to stay all the way to construction administration. Because when they taste that how much design actually is into this process, they want to stay with it. So if you go in the office, um, uh, just try to be on a project which go from the beginning, and you try to be on the project from the beginning till the end. If you have your own uh, office, be like Tom Main and Morphosis, and I mean it. I mean, if you look at it, they, uh, uh, just put as much integrity to your design and your effort as possible, because if you look, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, Morphosis was done about 72, 73 plus or minus. The first freestanding building, if I'm not mistaken, is a Crawford House which is 91, so, so 20 years, everything which Morphosis get established for, with, and uh, was known around the world and it's of high quality, all of these were like remodelings, additions, restaurants, you know, restaurants uh, all of this, but you just get this project and you make it and you just constantly work, work on it, and uh, there's this famous picture of uh, Tom and Michael Ortondi like actually nailing some of the walls on the, Crawford, uh, no, on the um, uh, Berggren house, right? <laughs> Berggren house, or, or, or some of those. So if you like, you just, it takes some time. I'm still learning from every project. I just kind of uh, literally start from scratch. And just, uh, as I said, it, the, the logo of my firm is like, it's a time-specific, team-specific, task-specific, team-specific, right? So every time you just, uh, it's, it's more like a based on a, a like on the, on the movie industry, in which you just, uh, if you look at like in a director like Kubrick, Every film is distinct uh, by aesthetic, and, uh, but there are common things, but like everything, it doesn't matter if it's a historical uh, piece or it's a futuristic piece, both of them are great in a different way, but uh, everyone is done specifically for the task uh, which is done. And in a way, that is, uh, that is the way, to be involved and engage in the project. Select the contractor. Okay, you make the bid and all that, and uh, you generally they take the, the one who has the less money. But given the complexity of the construction of this building of Tom, uh, how is possible? The bidding process. Yeah. How how you can make 
Well, this is a, 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 a decision, you know, suddenly when you have to. There is an enormous. Because he's asking, in a simple building, you normally just take the lowest bid, but this building is so complex that the lowest bid is unlikely to produce the best result. No, it's, it's unlikely to produce best result, and you just have to understand where the bid is coming from. Like, for a simple example, let's say we are making the bid for the. We were the highest, we are always above the price. So you have to re cut things or go back to redesign certain things to make the things fit. So uh, this is so complex, you know. It involves so many different technologies. It does, yeah. It seems to me that. Yeah. So you saying. bring everybody, as I said, I mean, this is, you bring with a contract everybody on the very beginning, like in a traditional contract, uh, like the traditional AI contract, um, you have like the, the, the triangle, which you know, you have the owner, you have a separate contract with yeah. the architect, and the owner have a separate contract uh, with the contractor. Uh, nothing connects them besides the general conditions, which are not signed. So they're reporting independently to the owner. With a multi-party -part, uh, contract, which is the integrated project delivery, one of them, you actually, and what was the case with the, uh, with the exterior wall for uh, Cooper Union, you get like six, seven different contractors and subcontractors, engineers, architects, and consultants, and they're signing the same contract. That is the meaning of integrated project delivery. Check it out. I, I, uh, I, I make whole class on integrated project delivery in, uh, um, in a different university. I have done it in. Integrated project delivery. Integrated project delivery is the that official that name. No. BIM is uh, building information modeling uh, that is part of the integrated project. The integrated project delivery uh, is addressing the entire way of delivery of the project and the contract relationship. So in this contract, you actually, m many parties are signing the same contract. So in there are like uh, uh, liabilities are just distributed between them. It's a, it's a whole thing. BIM is one of the components. The best way to maintain this is to have building information modeling, which is everybody uh, just contributes his uh, uh, part of the effort and is coordinated with everybody else into this virtual model, which gradually becomes a build building and which gradually start giving you information of how the build building is behaving so you can put it in your next design. So the BIM is one of the components. But AIA already have few, they're not perfect, AIA uh, uh, integrated project delivery contract. Their buildings already built, the entire building like, as an uh, integrated project delivery. On these uh, examples which I gave you, the, on, on Cooper, uh, there are three elements. One of them was the exterior wall, the other one was the, um, the, all of the uh, GFRC, the belly wall, which was there, and the, the, the ceilings. They were done like a multi-party contract. Many people uh, were, uh, were involved in the beginning. And they, and they for example, they get uh, uh, the way it is distributed. is like there is a stimulus or incentives for each one to make decisions. So for the contract, third, there is uh, incentives to, if you make it less expensive, there is a share of this uh, uh, profit which he gets to go for him. For the owner also, if you make a decision, uh, there is an incentive that he's gonna get the building faster for the architects we was for us was mostly there was no monetary incentive i mean for morphosis it was that we wanted the building to be done the way we want it because that is our uh, business card tom business card morphosis business card for uh, the next uh, project in a way can be very in the context can be very contra productive for the architects because one of the reason for example tom uh, bid it and morphosis bid it for the for the Javis Center, and the only reason they didn't get it is was actually was that you don't have a, a billion dollar building built. And so all of this effort he have made to, to so, so Tom was like, so if I was <laughs> gone over the budget like five times, you know, will be more beneficial for me than, uh, that, because there was no box to check, uh, you know, for how efficient you have done it in this tradition. For Cooper Union it was totally the opposite. They have, uh, they didn't, uh, I mean, uh, most probably it's like some of the client actually did not like Morphosis work. So for a fact, they didn't know. But when they discuss it with, uh, with the contractors, with the owners, what the service is, what is, and they accepted it. And after the, uh, that, the, their work, the work grew up on them. They understand it more because of sophisticated uh, work and they became like the, the fearless defenders of the, the 
Caltrans was the same thing. It's like when we started, um, and this I'm not revealing any secrets, they couldn't be three more different entities than you know, uh, the contractors from this course, we just came there, you're just coming get all of them dressed in blue, uh, shirts in the shirt. Tom Main is showing up with his mustard uh, uh, suit, uh, you know, and then all of the office, which is, have tattoos all over the place, you know, and it's like, and just for visually, and the way they were thinking, you know, it was all, all you, but everybody has the same goal. So what we did, the contract, we invited them to come in the office and to set up their office in Morphosis. So for a, in the same space which we were, it was a small former model shop space. So for three months, they work in the space, the team there worked with the same space with us. After three months, there was no question whatsoever about the, uh, the ability of Morphosis to perform. Later when the construction began, Morphosis moved the team on the job site. So it was like one of the most bonding relationship which was, uh, which was established. Okay, so... Uh... <laughs> Join us at the reception. We're going to get your CVs and apply for a job. It's a really good time to do it. Pablo seems like a good guy to work for. And thank you for a great lecture. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much.